Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this um, event, our book talk this evening, featuring Olivia Campbell and Lynn Lamberg in conversation. My name is Melissa Hendricks. I'm the Associate Director of the Johns Hopkins Science Writing Program. And I am going to start us off with a very short introduction of our two guests. So I am really delighted to welcome this evening Olivia Campbell, who is a 2014 graduate of the Johns Hopkins Science Writing Program. She's an independent writer who's published in many publications, including The Atlantic, New York Magazine, Smithsonian, Lit Hub, and others. And I am uh, proud to say that Olivia really found her passion for writing while she was in the program that has found her beats um, that she's passionate about. And those were women's health and parenting. And I was just, I hope I'm not going to embarrass you, Olivia. I was just flipping back through some of her old um, writing for her thesis. And this is the title of the piece that I really enjoyed. <clears throat> and it shows you where she really found her, her stride. Uh, the title was Convincing Teens That Breastfeeding Doesn't Suck. And, um, you know, we don't have enough puns in the world, right? So that was a, a terrific piece. Um, after uh, her work as an independent writer, Olivia found um, her interest in book writing, and uh, which has culminated in her new book from HarperCollins, Women in White Coats, How the First Women Doctors Changed the World of Medicine. And I also had forgotten that Lynn Lamberg, our other guest this evening, was, if I'm not mistaken, Olivia's thesis advisor when she was in the program. So we're coming full circle, which is really delightful. And I'm also uh, delighted to welcome Lynn. I just took a quick peek at Lynn's LinkedIn profile and see that she has been reporting on medicine for a remarkable 46 years. <laughs> um, which congratulations, Lynn, that is quite an accomplishment. Her writing has appeared in a host of publications from the Baltimore Sun to Psychology Today. And she's the author of several books about sleep and sleep science, including The Body Clock Guide to Better Health, which she co-wrote with researcher Michael Smolensky. And apart from her own writing, Lynn has served as the longtime volunteer book editor for the National Association of Science Writers, where she writes the column, Advanced Copy, Backstories on Books. And I do want to note that she is speaking this evening as an individual, not as a representative of NASW. But in her capacity at, as book editor, she's interviewed hundreds uh, of science and medical writers and shares their insights and wisdom about the book writing experience. And I do believe those are insights that I, uh, many of our students and friends of the program are eager to learn. So without further delay, I will turn over the screen to Olivia and Lynn. Thanks, Melissa. So Olivia, um, your book title is wonderfully descriptive, but you need to tell us more about what the book is about. Well, the book is about three women in the Victorian era who were among the first women to earn medical degrees. Um, they have come from very different backgrounds. Their personalities didn't always, you know, mesh. Um, but because of all the harassment and sexism they endured on their paths to earn their degrees and to practice as doctors, they decided that they had to overcome their differences and band together. So these three women um, got together and established a women's medical school in London. And the book is the story of uh, how they started out in their careers and how they eventually got together and worked together to establish this first uh, medical school for women in the UK. Well, that's a topic that's certainly not in the news every day. So where did you get the idea? Well, I, 
I was reading, uh, I like to read about history and about medicine. So um, just any essays I can get my hands on about those topics and, you know, feminist uh, history is always um, up my alley. But I was had re reading about um, this riot that happened in Philadelphia back in the Victorian era. Um, and Philadelphia is, is right outside where I live now. So that, that was, you know, extra interesting. But so it was the riot where men kind of threw his physical, you know, this really bad hissy fit, basically, um, when <laughs> women appeared in the classroom in a medical school alongside them, they like had organized, they were ready, they were like passing a note around uh, amongst each other, um, telling, you know, all their friends to, to come and basically scream and throw stuff at these women medical students, you know, the first time they were having a, a joint class, right? So that the women had never had a, a class with the men before. They were in the women's medical school in Philadelphia. You know, they had they were just trying desperately to petition to attend a clinical lecture alongside the men, and they've been petitioning for years and years. And so they finally let them in and said, "Okay, you can come." And then this happened. They just appeared, and this, a riot ensued. Um, and then I read about a riot almost exactly a year after that that happened in Edinburgh, Scotland, which is another place I'm fascinated by. But I lived there for a few years after I graduated from high school. Um, and that was basically the exact same thing. Uh, these women, it was the first time they're, they're kind of, you know, going with the men in a classroom and they're going to an exam. And the, the men were right, waiting for them at the gate. They were out, outside, they were drunk. They were you know, singing and screaming and throwing um, trash at them. They were throwing mud at them. They were throwing rotten vegetables. Uh, they, uh, they finally got into the exam room and the men let a sheep loose into the exam room. Like it was mayhem, right? So my, my thinking was, okay, there are these two, these two are too similar. You know, this is this is something's going on here. I need to know more of, about this. So uh, I really just wanted to to read about the full breadth of what women were going through to just just to try to become a doctor in, in this era. So, um, how did you decide then to um, pick your particular subjects? Um, I wanted the book to be a lot broader, actually. The first uh, version that I pitched actually included the women of the, the Women's Medical School of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. I kind of wanted to, to focus on them too because they were nearby. Um, so that on oh, the first round of submission out to editors that they were in that version. Um, and the almost universal feedback we got back was, you know, we like the writing, we like the, the topic, but it's too broad. Uh, there's too many people here, we need you to focus down. So honestly, the focusing on these three women was basically uh, instigated by the editors in the first round of submission that said, this is, you know, this is too broad, try again. Um, so I went back to the drawing board and was like, okay, you know, I, I really want to talk about all these amazing women that are to talk about. There's so many cool women at this time, right? But I need to focus and find the, the one story, the one narrative that's going to represent all the women in this time, right? So I focused and I found so many overlaps between these three women. The, um, Elizabeth Blackwell, who was working in the U.S. mostly, um, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson was, was in London, and then Sophia Jex Blake was in uh, London and in Scotland. Um, and they, the more, the more I dug in their stories, the more overlap I found, the more connections between their stories. And so I decided to drop the, the women from Pennsylvania and just, you know, zoom in on this relationship between these, the main three women and how they decided finally to get together and start a school in the UK. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> what do you cover in this book that hasn't been covered in previous books about these women? I feel like the just the story of their how they work together is really kind of unknown. Like there are individual biographies. I mean, not so much uh, of the the two British women there, but there are a lot of biographies of Elizabeth Blackwell. There's you know people kind of know her uh, in this country, but they don't really know the story of how she moved to London and and found it helped found the school there. Also, um, you know they know that she had a women's medical school in New York that she worked on, but they didn't maybe know that she continue that thread and, and also did the same work in the UK. Um, 
so I, I feel like this the story of their overlap, the story of how they come together, uh, this is really kind of a new story. The women's medical school that they established in London is really known as Elizabeth Garrett Anderson School. Like that's the name that's attached to it now. That's that's who um, it, you know it's been named after basically, uh, and it's it wasn't her idea. It was Sophia's idea. And they, Sophia got kicked out basically at the, at the end because she was, you know, wasn't the right personality or whatever. But um, just kind of putting her back in, putting Sophia back in the story because she's been forgotten. Uh, you know, of, of the three, she is not as well known. She's known for her exploits, maybe in, in Edinburgh, the riot that that she was in. She was involved in the riot in, in Scotland, but she maybe isn't known a, a, in connection to the school in London. And I think it's it's only fair to kind of put her put her back in there. Okay. <clears throat> well, you're you're mentioning you mentioned a, a minute ago that um, the focus that you uh, reached finally was helped by some feedback you got on your first submission. But before you get to that stage, you have to uh, get an agent and write a proposal. So um, you mentioned in your report for advanced copy that you had um, heard from agents after publishing. Um, uh, an essay, and then you had to select from those agents and uh, go on from there. So can you tell us a little bit about that process? Because for most writers, having an agent come to them after seeing something they've written is just a fantasy. <laughs> I, I never expected to be one of the ones, you know, plucked from obscurity or, or whatever. Uh, I, yeah, it, it's basically the dream, right? It's to, to to be approached by multiple agents, not, not even just one agent. Like, you know, you, the hope is, is always that you, you're sending into the slush pile of an agent and, you know, maybe cross your fingers, someone will, will call you back and it, it, hopefully that something will happen. But I, I was floored when I, I heard from multiple agents. And um, what they told me is that they liked how original my essay was, the idea of the thing, the way I was interweaving different topics together. That's what really struck them. So uh, if you want to catch an agent's attention, I guess a lot of people try to do the like the viral personal essay, but that's not really my, my genre. So I wrote about climate change and, and fairy tales. Um, so the, the way I weave climate change and, and culture and that, that really how original the idea was is what both agents told me is what drew them to, to contact me. So agents are out there and they are reading. Um, just I guess you just got to be original. But yes, I, I was as shocked as anyone. Um, and then so my agent that I chose, I, I chose her because I, I got to go and kind of she gave me contact to talk to a couple of her clients and I, I researched um, the books that she represented and I, we just we were a really good fit. I, I haven't actually met her in person. I've talked to her on the phone, but she is really uh, all this all this time you've not met her in person yet. Right? She's incredible. I uh, I would not be where I am without her. She's my my biggest cheerleader. That's probably my biggest piece of advice: is find an agent that is your biggest champion. But but that is also realistic with you. My agent would net would will tell me when something is not working. You know, but she's very much a fan of my writing and a champion of my work and she I know she stands up for my best interests all the time um but yeah it, it, I think her really believing in, in my vision and having my back is was really helpful uh, very very important um so she basically asked me are you do you have any book length projects going on and of course I feel like imposter syndrome because I'm like uh, you know people so many people out there that have desperate to write a book. They've, this is what they've always wanted to do. And here's a, somewhat, an agent coming to me and saying, hey, you should write a book. And I'm like, I don't have a book planned. I, I don't know. Um, so feeling guilty about, you know, not being, of course, I want to write a book. Of course, that's always in the back of your mind as, as a journalist, as a writer, probably. Um, but I did I have one on, on paper? Not, not necessarily. Um, so I went and just kind of they had a couple ideas like brainstorm. I, I did a riff off of the essay that I wrote that attracted her at, um, to see maybe if I could, you know, broaden that out into a book length project. Um, and then I had a couple other different ideas, just, just a few paragraphs, nothing major. And then I um, 
just talked it over with my agent and she said, which one do you really feel passionate about? Which one do you think you can sit with, you know, and not get bored of for the next few years? That's the key, right? When you're switching over from, you know, journalism to book writing to those few thousand word pieces to this 80,000 word thing, you have to really live it for a few years. You have to dig in and you have to, you know, be sure that you're not going to get really sick of it before the before the end is, to, is up, right? Before you're done, before you've produced a book, you have to make sure that you can handle, you know, being in it for that long and not getting tired of it. Um, so I basically just said, okay, this, this topic, I think I can really dig into this topic. This looks great. I would love to poke around and research archives and, and, and live with these women in my brain for a few years. Let's, let's go with this. Uh -huh. And so she was immediately excited about that too. Yeah, she was. Yeah. She, mm. she was really um, very sure that it was marketable. Um, very sure that the hidden histories of women in, in general and in science, especially are, you know, were fairly hot at, at the moment. So I think she, she felt strongly that she could sell it. So um, you wrote a proposal. How long did that take? Uh, it was about a year of writing the proposal because I was working freelance still. You know, I'm still trying to to make money. And before you know, before you get the book deal, you don't have the money, so you have to you know steal those moments to put that proposal together. And I'd never written a proposal that you know in this area before in, in history and biography. So I wasn't, you know, it was a learning process for me as well. She sent me the template that they used. Uh, so I had that as a guide and my, my agent was always available for, you know, if I had questions along the way or something, but so I would work on it and then I would send it to my agent and she would say, this isn't working. Let's, you know, add more here, less here. And she really helped me shape it um, into something that was marketable. Uh, so it was about a year of back and forth uh, with my agent of really shaping it. <laughs> and then we sent it out uh, on the first round of submission and then everyone's like, great, except cut some people out of it. So then it was back to the drawing board again. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't hear clearly what you said. Did great cut the people out of it? Cut, cut some people out of it. Like, right, so, the, we love the writing, but there's too many people. We, we need just you to focus on just a few characters. Like, <laughs> um, so then after, a few more months of, of cutting the, those people out of the proposal and focusing in on these, these just these three women, um, we sent it back on the, to the second round uh, to all the whole new list of, of editors. And it was almost universal yeses and universal interest um, from editors saying, yes, we, we'd like to talk to you. Let's get on the phone. So that it was very, very exciting. Mm -hmm. So then did you have multiple offers for the book? Uh, I did. <laughs> I, had, I had to talk to two different houses in HarperCollins. Um, and so it was it was kind of a weird deal. It's like they offer you an amount of money and it's the same amount of money, whichever imprint you go with, because it's all under the HarperCollins umbrella. Like this is HarperCollins's offer to you, but you could pick which imprint because both these imprints want the book. So I had to go on the phone and, and chat with both of the different um, representatives from both of the imprints along with my agent and we kind of had to talk separately with my agent decide which one we felt like we were getting along with better which one had the better vision for what you know that aligned with ours right so you're talking about which editor you felt more rapport with right exactly okay so that's great so um from from that point um you started on your research or you had you had done a lot of research undoubtedly for the proposal itself. But tell yes. us tell us more about what you did to research and write the book. So yeah, that that year of the proposal, there was a lot of research that went in there. And unfortunately, you know, the research I done on the women that ultimately got cut out, that was not useful. And, but you know, it, it was still interesting. Maybe I'll turn it into an essay. Um, but it, it was a lot of research that first year for the proposal. And then how I structured my research was I found everything I could online and went through like really old books, right? So um, I kind of approached it like a profile almost. Uh, so if you're gonna profile someone who's alive as a journalist, you would uh, talk to that person 
you would talk to their relatives, you would talk to their enemies, right? Their detractors, uh, you would talk to places they worked, um, that kind of thing. So I did the best I could to kind of recreate that with people that weren't alive. I found all that I could that was written by the person themselves, which was a, a fair, uh, you know, there's a lot to be found written by these three women. Um, letters, uh, essays published, um, things in the newspapers, things in medical journals, all, all kinds of different places, books they've written. And then I, I zoom out and I look for anything that their relatives have written. So there's lots of essays that Elizabeth Blackwell's sister had written about her. So that's an interesting point of view. She had some cool anecdotes. So I got to pull um, that her sister remembered from them growing up. Um, there's a biography of Elizabeth Garrett written by her daughter. So, you know, that's a really close contact situation. So there's a lot of good info there. And it included a lot of letters, um, just like verbatim copied letters <laughs> from Elizabeth Garrett. Um, Sophia was a little trickier. She, her partner, um, Margaret, wrote her biography um, and published it after Sophia died. Sophia asked for all of her papers to be destroyed upon her death. So luckily her partner, Margaret, was a writer. She was also a physician, she, but as she was putting herself through medical school, um, Margaret wrote novels. Um, she actually wrote a novel about a woman medical student. Um, but so after Sophia died, she, Margaret collected all her papers and kind of included some things in the biography that she was writing of her. So there's also verbatim diary entries and letter you know, snippets of Sophia's that are in that biography. So that was, is really the only thing we have for her besides what Sophia wrote herself and what is in the newspapers. So Sophia was written about a lot in newspapers and a lot in uh, medical journals. Also, she was kind of notorious at the time. Um, she liked to make a fuss, she liked to make a scene, she liked to say whatever she wanted to say in public meetings and you know the press ate that kind of behavior up. Um, her peers and colleagues didn't exactly love it, but it, it, you know, she got the job done uh, in the end. But so I, I found everything I could um, from the relatives. Um, and then I find kind of the oldest biographies I could find of these, right? So biographies written like in the 20s of some of these people, um, just really any scholarly books written about women doctors in general uh, at this time in this era. Um, there's a lot of good ones of those. And so I read everything I could online and in these used books, old books I could find. Uh, and then once I was done with that is when I, at near the end of my process is when I went into the actual archives. Because at that point, I knew what I needed. I knew what questions I had that I needed to answer in the archives. So it might sound like backwards, but I didn't really want to just walk into the archives, you know, knowing nothing about what I wanted to see because there's so much there. If I, if it would have taken forever to, to dig through all of it that's in the archives. So I needed a kind of a game plan of like, okay, this letter is mentioned in this book and I want to see, I want to read all of this letter. I don't want just this, this sentence that's you know copied over in this book or in this essay. I need to, to read the rest of it. I need some more context. So I had very specific questions that I needed answered by the time I got to those actual archives. And I, it was very lucky that it was in like September, 2019 that I was in that, at that point, I was doing my research travel. I went to New York, I went to London, I went to Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, so very, very lucky that I got to travel and do that research. I wouldn't be able to do it probably right this moment. Um, I think some archives are doing some, like you can get a remote research assistant kind of deal going on where you can get someone to go into the archives, but it would be really tricky to do right now. Um, but I, I was writing pretty much along the way here. I'd, I'd done so much reading and research uh, with the proposal. So once it was time to start, you know, once I got the deal, it was time to start writing. It wasn't, oh, I tried to do, you know, more writing than I, I, I didn't want to do all the research first, right? You can't, at some point you have to say, I got to start writing um, because you could research forever. Honestly, you could just keep reading, reading and it, you have to tell yourself at, at some point I have to stop researching and start writing. So what had, what ended up for my schedule um, was I kind of wrote a chapter a, a month, basically. Like I, I laid out um, my due dates, my deadlines, 
um, which my editor gave me multiple ones along the way. She wanted to see a few chapters every few months, basically. So I said, okay, I, I need to produce a chapter a month. And that worked out really well for me. So that kind of a schedule, of course, helped you develop a, a rhythm to the writing and um, gave you a way to, to plan what you were doing from month to month. Um, uh, you, you mentioned um, a, mi um, a minute ago that you were approaching it as a journalist. And I, I just want to clarify, you're not, in, by background, also a historian, right? Right. It Exactly. No, I, I do not have a history degree. I have an undergrad degree in journalism. Um, and I have always loved writing profiles. So I feel like biography is kind of just like a writing a historical profile, right? Mm -hmm. So, right. But um, do you think uh, your research uh, might have uh, gone a different way if you had been a historian? There's, there's the in the back of my mind, the whole time I'm writing this, I'm going, uh, I don't want to anger the historians, right? I don't want to get something wrong. I don't want to, to do, you know, I want to do justice to these women. And I also want to do justice to historical biography. I, I don't want to, to mess this up for other people. Um, I don't want to be getting hundreds of emails from, from historians going, oh, you totally got this wrong. That's not how they use the bathroom or, you know, whatever the, the little detail was, I was, really determined to, to, to get it right, uh, hopefully. Um, but it, it's, always, it's always there in the back of your mind that you know if I was a historian, maybe I'd be more accepted as an author of this. But I really feel like being a journalist uh, helped me a, a lot in that I was able to, I feel like I'm really good at identifying uh, which anecdote and which quote is going to show do the most work to show who this person is right so when you're on the phone for an interview as a journalist you have to have that ear that says oh that's that's the quote right there right you, when you play it back you go okay that's the one that, that says that's perfect right so I, I tried to have that kind of journalist ear while I was reading the words instead right so I'm I feel like I was really good at saying oh this little story it tells you so much it's going to show not tell it's going to show exactly who this person is instead of me doing a lengthy you know multiple paragraphs about who this person is that little story in this book over here that's going to tell the story right uh, well i i think that it's uh, great to think of a biographer coming into it with a journalist point of view because you do get what even with just a little snippet of their similitude that tells that larger story. Um, your book includes a lot of specific details on, uh, say, Elizabeth Blackwell's education, her clothing, um, even the weather. I mean, you reported, for example, that on uh, Blackwell's graduation day, the, the bright sun reflected off the snow. So how did you find those kinds of details? Those are, uh, it's like hitting the jackpot. I feel like I, the, the, all the places that I found, I could like recreate full conversations and have scenes like that's like the historical jackpot, right? It's like, oh my gosh, I could bring these characters to life. This is going to be great. Um, but those are, it's just really digging. Um, that was, I want to say it was a, someone who was present at the graduation event had written a letter to someone else and it, it had gotten saved in the record for whatever reason. So like someone was just like, hey, I was at this event. This is what was happening. This is what it was like. Um, like the, the, the weird singing of the, of the woman at the beginning of that event, like that was in the letter of, of someone that was just in the audience uh, writing home, basically saying, this is what happened at this event. So there's just little casual letters that people, you know, running off about something they wanted to do provided me with the all these extra details that just really paint the picture perfectly. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, in, <clears throat> in putting um, your book together, did you use uh, Scrivener, uh, Trello, or other book organization software? Or if not, how did you keep track of all these multiple facts? Um, I just used uh, regular word. <laughs> I didn't use anything fancy. I do have Scrivener, but it's, it's kind of daunting. I, maybe I'll use it next time um, because I definitely was kicking myself at the end of this process uh, when it came to 
you know, writing up my, my sources, doing my citations, because it was a nightmare. I, I essentially ended up fact checking myself um, because I had essentially only had a file uh, of sources. I had a, another separate Word document that had all the links and all the titles, links to all the online things, and then all the titles of the books that I, I was pulling from. Um, and I kind of separated by who, which character it was mostly about, or whether it was about just kind of women in general, or if it was about you know medicine in general at this time. But I try to do a decent job of balancing out the women biography part of it, and also the kind of historical medicine details. I really I wanted it to be a science book too. I wanted to show what exactly medicine was like at this time. So I didn't. I didn't want to be too gory, but it was pretty, you know, it's pretty gross at the time. But um, I, I really wish I'd done a better job of organizing that for sure. That's something, a lesson that I, I learned the hard way this time. So next, next book, next book, I'll do better. Um, so then I, it was during the pandemic that I was sitting doing final edits and, and producing my citations, which take up like almost 40 pages at the end of the book. Um, and I kind of re had to check every single one of them. So I'm sitting in my room, just like kicking myself going, why, why didn't I do this better? I think there is a function on Word where you can connect uh, every quote, every fact, you know, to your end notes uh, while you're doing it. And I will do that next time. But um, I, I, I actually really enjoyed doing, doing it because I got to fact check myself. I didn't have to worry too much about, you know, hiring a fact checker or not because I did sit with the text and go through it all the way again and said, okay, this mm -hmm. quote was definitely from this book. This thing was definitely, this fact was definitely in this paper and, and et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, what stage was the book in when the pandemic hit? Um, let's see. I The last thing I got to do <laughs> in the real world um was meet with my editor for lunch in person i went up to new york um and she plopped her giant you know red inked copy of my <laughs> a manuscript on the table and i i freaked out a little bit but she i wasn't allowed to look at it she's like no no no, you can't you can't see it she was she was for her her reference only but i got to meet with her and we got to chat in person and it was amazing because it's just so much easier to you know just talk it over um just about like she had fine she'd read through the whole manuscript as a whole um and just wanted to talk about oh maybe let's put a little bit more of this person in let's um cut down on this thing over here let's um cut these chapters a little bit more and just you know those kinds of things uh so then i got to go back uh and then things started shutting down when I was in final edit mode, basically. So uh, I did the best I could to write the, the best book I could with uh, my kids running around, my three boys running around at home <laughs> while I was on the editing <laughs> stage. But so I hope I hope it's okay. <laughs> right, I was going I was going to go right into that. I know you have three boys. Um, can you tell us how old they are and? and how you structured your writing life around their schedules, particularly when they had to attend school online? Oh, God. So <laughs> um, the first thing I did with my book advance was daycare. So my youngest uh, uh, was probably three at the time when I got the book deal. I think maybe, maybe he was two and a half. I'm trying to think. Um, but so yeah, he was just home with me and I was trying to freelance with, with a toddler, which is a nightmare. Uh, so I was mostly writing on the weekends, writing in the evenings when my husband could take the kids, basically. Um, so daycare was the first thing that ate all my money. <laughs> and he, so my youngest just turned five. Um, now the book is done. But there was, you know, I was in final editing when they all went online. And, you know, when you're four, you, you're not interested in online school. It's not something you can do independently. It's not, that's not going to happen. So my older kids were, were mostly fine. Oh, I have an eight-year-old and a 13-year-old and they're, you know, they're, they're mostly okay with it. The, the second grader, uh, he kind of caught him out not doing all his work at one point, but so that, you know, you gotta definitely gotta keep an eye on him still. But we kind of, my husband uh, told his workplace, 
he that he had to take a break in the middle of the day basically he from like two o'clock in the afternoon he gave me like three or four hours every afternoon to say okay it's my turn to work basically uh so that that got me through all the final edits uh his, his basically his job being flexible is, is allowed me to finish i don't know if i would have finished otherwise um because it is always a struggle to find time when you're writing from home all the time anyway um but right. I, I so finally Olivia and Lynn, I'm sorry, it's Melissa rudely jumping no, no. <laughs> in to say um, it's sorry. So sorry to interrupt you, Olivia. I think we have a bunch of great questions in the Q&A. So I'm going to suggest that maybe we shift to those and um, then can maybe go back and forth with Lynn. But the first thing I want to say is here's the book. <laughs> And um, I'm looking forward to having a free moment to read it, uh, Olivia. And I'm on I only regret this um, online format because you won't have a chance to sign it for me. But I do want to say to folks out there that in the chat box, we have a link to where you can order the book. And there's some other goodies in the chat box about NASW and the like. If you are interested, you in the audience yourselves are interested in publishing a book, take a look at the great resources that NASW has. And um, so now I'll just get to th these questions. I'll try to get to all of them. There's some really great ones out here. And the first one is from our um, director of the writing programs, Karen Hooper. This is a little self promo, so <laughs> forgive us, but she just wants to remind um, students and to let everybody know that the MAN writing program has a class this summer called Writing the Nonfiction Book Proposal. And so it's a marvelous class that uh, was introduced a couple of years ago. Um, and so if you, anybody has a book project in mind, consider taking the class. The instructor is Brett Martin, and um, there are a lot of guest speakers from the publishing industry, agents and editors and the like. So uh, that's our little advertisement there, forgive me. But I will get to some other questions here. Um, did, so Olivia, this is uh, for you. Did you have a lot of involvement from editors uh, just beyond the request that you focus the story more on those select characters? Um, and uh, this, um, Questioners saying, I've heard from other authors that they were left pretty much on their own. That seems to be the way it is these days in book publishing. How involved were the editors? So I was kind of surprised that after the first round of submission, we didn't, after we changed it, we didn't go back to those same editors to submit it again. But we, it was like my agent had a tiered thing where she's like, okay, this is the first round of people as a second round. Because we had, there was one publisher that was showed like, a little bit more interest you know they weren't it wasn't a hard no basically they were still kind of open to the idea in the first round but then it, it was ultimately a no um so one of the uh, there was a male editor at one of on the first round of submissions that said it was um what did he say it was like too inspiring or like too it was too happy basically like it was too, <laughs> you want a sad story about women like i i don't know <laughs> come on so that was an interesting comment um, and I was I was also talking to an editor in the UK. I, I, we're still trying to sell UK rights. Um, the editor in the UK wanted a lot more gory, horrible details about medicine at the time, which is something that my editor in the US definitely didn't want. You know, mm -hmm. so it's, it, that's interesting. If I do ultimately sell somewhere else, and they want me to tweak it, or they want to, you know more adding in or something like that, that's that was weird. Um, but the editor, the editing house we ultimately went with it she was very involved. I mean, she, I really appreciate it. We talked about it beforehand, what to do about the deadlines. Like she definitely didn't want to kind of leave me out to dry. She wanted me to have deadlines along the way so she could be sure that I was producing something that was along the lines of, you know, what she had in mind as a first time author for me. It was great because I, I had those deadlines and I wasn't waiting till the very last minute to, you know, write everything at the end was, you know, she, I, I have to make sure that I'm putting out, um, you know, the right kind of content that I'm actually producing content period um, that will have a book at the end of this. Right. So she was very involved. It, it wasn't a whole lot of editing 
you know, up until the end of it, when she got the whole manuscript, but there was definitely, she would come back with, uh, you know, yes, you're on the right track, basically. And if I hadn't been on the right track, I'm sure I would have heard about it before, you know, she wasn't going to wait till the very end to be like, oh, this is totally wrong. You're doing it, you know, <laughs> you have to start all over again or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's great. An another question here about the substance of your book. You said you lived with these three women and, um, Sorry, my question just jumped away. Okay, there are more and more women in medical careers now. So is there a lesson for now that you could pass on after finishing this major project? Interesting. Well, yes, I, I live with the women in my, my brain is what I meant. I didn't actually, live, but <laughs> they took up residence in, in my mind. Um, I definitely think there's, I mean, unfortunately, the, it's, it's still applicable today that there are still sexism in medicine, you know, there's still, uh, you know, harassment, gender-based harassment going on. And I think we can definitely learn from the conversations they were having at that time. There, women have always been tired uh, of being asked, you know, can you have it all? Can you do this? You know, do you think your brain can handle doing this? Like we're still having these conversations sometimes and we've been having them for over 200 years and, and they were already tired of talking about it back then. Um, so yes, the story is as inspiring as it is infuriating uh, and, and there are still, there's still work to be done today in, in trying to rid medicine for, of the, all the sexism that, that still abounds because there are more women med students than there are men right now. But as you get further and further up the, the ladder, right, uh, there it gets lower and lower. So like they're, they're not, the leaders, the leadership uh, isn't there. Mm. Okay. A question about the grueling nature of the book writing process. I think many, <laughs> uh, many folks would like to know your take on this. W what kept you going when you hit an obstacle or lost steam? Or did you never lose steam? Were you just so, you know, enthralled by the subject that um, you didn't hit the wall, so to speak? Yeah, I think for me, the big wall was uh, imposter syndrome of feeling like, you know, you have to produce something that's more than your talent is like, it was the idea I had to remind myself of the idea that they bought the book based on my proposal, they weren't buying some other book, they weren't buying a better book, they bought my book, right. <laughs> so uh, they weren't expecting me to suddenly be like a different writer, a better writer, you know, but like, winning awards or anything you know like they're, they're not they knew what they bought they bought me and I'm enough is what I had to keep telling myself and the other thing I like to do was like go go to a bookstore online and find like the stupidest book I could like well this person this wrote this book exists so you know my book will be fine <laughs> it's kind of little pep talks to yourself like if that can get published then what I'm writing is fine uh, but yeah I mean there are definitely times where you're, you're going to feel kind of bored honestly like about what's you know and hopefully you're not boring the reader but you you try you know try to take a break from it if you can if you can take a minute or you know switch who you're writing about who you're reading about um just try to change it up find something um maybe something funny in history to write about you know start start digging it into a different aspect that you have to learn about to kind of change it up to kind of re reignite that fire that you first had when you started. Um, but I have a little picture that I printed out of the three women together. It's not, they're not physically together, but it's like the only time that they've been together is like for an ad um, to raise money for the, one of the women's hospitals that they helped establish. Um, so it's the only time that I could find all three of them in one little picture, but I put it up above my work area and I just kept telling myself, that this is for them, it's to do them justice. And, you know, if, if, if I'm representing them truly, then that's, then my, my job is done. Hmm. I like that. On a more practical note, was the advance enough for you to solely work on the research and writing for the book? Or did you have to juggle freelance writing and book writing? And do I, you have tips on juggling if you did? Oh, um, 
I was just as shocked as anyone could be to get a six-figure book deal. I uh, was like, are they sure that's me? I, <laughs> this is my first book. So my, and before we, you know, submit the, the proposal to anyone, my agent, you know, is like, okay, setting the expectations. She's like, for your first book, you'll probably get about $30,000. That's, you know, that's probably normal for a first book kind of thing. And, you know, she gives me the spiel. And then when she calls me a few weeks later, finally, and tells me, you know, this amount of money, I like start swearing at her. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's no effing way. <laughs> I was totally shocked. So I, it was definitely enough for me to stop freelancing, uh, which was kind of good and bad because I could totally immerse myself in this work, but also um, I kind of feel out of the game, like coming out of it now when I'm trying to like, you know, re-up the, the freelance, you know, I, I don't have any contacts anymore. Everyone's moved, this publication is gone, you know, <laughs> so I, maybe it would have been nice to, to keep in touch a little bit, and, you know, maybe get, get more things published along the way. I think there's something to be said for for keeping your contacts, staying staying fresh uh, with interviewing, because um, it's it's hard to you know call researchers up again when you've just been reading in the archives. You haven't really been flexing those journalist muscles as much. So, <laughs> but yes, I I could afford to um, pay for daycare and to pay for plane tickets and hotels in, in Europe to go and do the research. So that it, it was incredible. Yeah, oh, that that's so cool. Um, we're going to have a surprise guest to answer this next question, um, and I didn't introduce earlier our faculty program coordinator, Sam Apple, who's been lurking in the background and who also is a book author, has volunteered to take on this next question, which is, I read that 98% of all published books have fewer than 5,000 copies published, and that most books don't earn back the advance. Obviously, expectations are higher for this book. What are they? Um, Melissa, you're, you're asking me to jump in on that? It says you would. <laughs> <laughs> I have a little <laughs> message that says Sam uh, Apple is going to answer this question, no? Uh, OK. Uh, I, I wasn't aware of that, but I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Um, yeah, I saw there was, there was a recent article that um, <laughs> Most, you know, the vast majority of books sell fewer than 5,000 copies and, uh, you know, the industry is changing, but, um, you know, it, it's all perspective. I mean, 5,000 kind of seems like a good, good number to me. So, you know, you, know, you get less than that. There, there's certainly no shame in that, but it, it is, you know, one of the unfortunate realities that the book business, like many, you know, businesses, I suppose, is sort of tilted towards, you know, the people that are most famous and have the most followers on, on social media or whatnot. So, um, you know, I, I think there are, are many, you know, quote unquote, breakout books and, you know, authors who are lucky have support of uh, their publishing house and their editors. But, um, you know, there are many, many great books that never get published and many great books that get published and, and don't sell out of copies. So, I don't think that um, any author should should ever feel bad about that. It's mostly out of your hands. You know, all you can do is write the best book you can, and um, then uh, you know, hope for the best and and not pay too close attention to the numbers. Uh, every now and then you, you get lucky, but it, but it's tough. And uh, what's really nice, I think, is that um, you know, even if you don't reach tens of thousands of people, you know, you get some nice responses from from the people who matter that you want to hear from. Mm -hmm. I was very lucky in that I got on a couple lists before uh, publication. I got on a list of CNN books. Um, I had a New York Post do a really great uh, write up before publication date. Um, I was kind of scared of what New York Post was going to write because there's no telling with them, but they, they did an incredible job of, of, of writing about the book. I was very pleasantly surprised. Um, I, I don't expect to earn out my advance. Um, but I do know that in the first two weeks, I sold about 5,000 copies. So I, you know, I feel pretty good about it <laughs> myself. I don't know what the, they're hoping to, to sell. Honestly, I didn't ask um, what their goal was, but I know that they've had bookstores um, place, you know, re been reordering it. So they've been selling it, it's been moving. Um, so I, I, I think I'm doing okay. The, my goal is, to sell enough books that I can sell the next book, right? So I wanna be 
uh, I want my editors to know that I'm willing to do what it takes to sell it, right? I'm willing to get on the radio. I'm willing to, you know, write those essays for publications to, you know, to, to do my best. And, and also I feel like it, being easier to work with is, is a good, you know, attribute to have. Like I may not sell millions of copies, but I'm a pretty easy author to work with. And I, you know, I produce decent copies. So let me write another book, you know? <laughs> Uh, one of the questions I was going to ask you, Olivia, was uh, what's next? So I had, I had a list of three ideas. So my agent wanted me, the, my editor, they, they like me, they love me at, the, at my publishing house. So um, I, I actually have a full proposal written about a book about the placenta, which is pure science journalism. And it's like nine chapters. You go through the nine months of the placenta's existence. I think it's fascinating. I, I think it would be interesting. Um, but she, so my, my editor was like, mm, we want you, we don't necessarily want that. <laughs> they want me to do again, a, a narrative nonfiction about people. They don't, you know, they're not, not really as into the science journalism. So I could technically take that book somewhere else if I wanted to, but I'm not really sure if I could report that in the world as it is today with the pandemic. So I could put, you know, I'll push that one off a few years, but so my agent asked me to come up with a few, um, ideas, maybe three ideas minimum to send to the editor, um, just like maybe five or six paragraphs of an idea, uh, basically what I did the first time in, in coming up with the ideas for my agent, but this time it's for my editor, just to say, hey, do you like any one of these? Um, would you like me to fully flesh out a full proposal on any one of these ideas? So I actually, um, there was one idea that I couldn't I couldn't make it work. I kept sending it to my agent. I was like, I love these characters. I love this. And she kept coming back and going, it's not, it's not a book though. She's like, it's, it's a great, maybe it's a thesis. It's like an academic paper, but it's not a book. It's not a book yet. I'm like, I keep beating this idea over the head. Like, please, please be, I love these people. I want you to be an idea, but it's just not. And so, you know, letting go of that. But I actually have five ideas that I sent to my agent. Um, <laughs> so now I have too many, <laughs> but hopefully, hopefully they pick up one of them. They're almost all of them are kind of hidden histories of women in science. So not necessarily medicine again, but um, looking at marine biologists, um, I'm looking at um, women thinkers that communicated with Darwin is one of my ideas. Um, so different different aspects of science and mm -hmm. history and women. I personally like that last idea. That's <laughs> really interesting. And uh, your editor sounds, uh, your agent sounds great, by the way. Uh, just moving on to another couple of questions before our time is up. And this is a challenging one for either of you, Olivia Lynn or Sam, if you wish to entertain this. How does one balance writing on topics that coincide with your truth? For example, a writer on subjects germane to someone like a gay Latino living with HIV, which receives very little attention. Um, so that balancing writing about your truth with writing to sustain yourself financially, is it possible to do both without losing the spark of why one loves their work? I write about lots of different things. Um, one of my most popular pieces was an essay I wrote about being a fat ballet dancer uh, and as a teenager. So. <laughs> It, I, I get so much mail about that piece. Uh, I wrote an essay for Catapult about how um, basically I was a, a really incredible ballet dancer and I almost went professional, except everyone, every school I went to was like, oh, she's really good, but she needs to lose a few pounds. And I just never could lose enough weight for anyone. I was never skinny enough, but I was always good enough. Um, and then the Guardian contacted me and said, we want to republish this. And they paid me almost the same amount I'd earned in the first place from Catapult. So I made a, I made some good money on that piece too. But um, yeah, so I, I, I don't know. I feel like I really love essays. And I feel like when I get a good idea that they're, they're really fun to write. I've written essays um, about being a mother with depression uh, for good housekeeping. I wrote an essay, personal essay for a parents magazine that was in print. Uh, though my agent actually sold it to them for print. It was $2 a word. It's my most I've ever been paid. Um, but that was about my complicated uh, childbirth experience and subsequent postpartum depression and kind of navigating that. Uh, so I definitely make space for those, you know, 
pieces that are pieces of myself. Uh, I don't expect them to go viral. I don't expect to write a memoir necessarily about them. Um, but yeah, I have to I have to put those little little pieces of me out there too. And at the same time, I I love giving you know insight into other women's lives as well as a biographer. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay. Back on a practical note, um, somebody is asking, what is the reasoning behind submitting to different editors after you make the edit suggested by the first round? I, that's what I, I'm not really sure, honestly. Um, uh, like I said, I thought we would go back to the first people that had given us the feedback, but I guess once you get a no from someone, it's a no and you just move on. Um, but I, I guess you just assume that the next round of people is are, are going to like it. That's what happened in my case. Like we would have gone on to the third set if, if the second set had said no, but it was, it was almost universal interest uh, with the second round. Um, so I guess it, it's kind of, it was kind of a totally different book, not totally different, but it was a different story for sure um, by the time we hit the second round of editors. Mm, okay. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, first of all, there's a comment here from somebody who says um, she would totally read that book about the placenta and thinks <laughs> many other women would too. So there you go. <laughs> I would love to write it. I, I, I'm so ready. <laughs> um, Somebody's asking how you handled dialogue in the book. Did you recreate dialogue or quote from written documents? And it seems like you need dialogue to make the characters feel real and keep the narrative moving, yet you couldn't interview these people. It was so hard. Like I'm definitely not a fiction writer, but at, at certain points I was very much like, I wish I could just make something up and be like, oh, she flipped her hair back or, you know, just adding those little details that I, I, I have no idea. Was she drinking tea at this point? Was she, you know, how was she sitting? What was she doing? Um, so I did the best I could within the framework of it all has to be true. <laughs> um, so I really just trying to find those, there was uh, very few times where I recreated and I did almost all of it what were direct quotes. Um, it was like a couple of scenes I recreated from letters that um, I think it was Elizabeth Garrett had written to her friend describing the scene, basically saying, well, I said this, my dad said this, I said, so I, those kinds of things I recreated um, and I hope they were accurate, but, but uh, you know, I, like I said, I did the best I could. And then other times uh, there were instances in newspapers um, or written in like diary entries or something where they had actually written quotes uh, of what had happened. So I, I could have those legitimate scenes recreated. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm going to slip in this one final question because I'm sure a lot of people have this same question, which is, would you recommend for an early nonfiction writer um, seeking an agent to gain access to better writing opportunities? And either Olivia or and or Lynn, I'm sure many folks would appreciate your thoughts on this. I think, I mean, if you're, if you're ready for, yeah, I, I think there, it, it's always a good thing to have an agent. I, I definitely, and, and especially if you think you have a book length idea, definitely approach an agent. I would never go to a publisher without an agent. <laughs> um, but so the, when I sold the book, uh, before my agent even called me, they had asked for, they said, here's X amount of money. We'll give you this for, for worldwide rights. And before my agent called me, she had negotiated North American rights for the same amount of money. <laughs> mm -hmm. So like she, she's already advocating for me, at, you know, at every step of the way. So, and like I said, she, she sells some essays for me too, to print magazine. Like she, if it's something I really care about, I'll do a lot of the own pitching, a lot of pitching on my own also, but if there's something big and I want to, you know, hit a big market that only takes agent and submissions or whatever, then yes, she, your agent is, if you find a good one, they're, they're going to get that money for you. They're going to be the advocate for you. Um, but yeah, I think if you feel like you're ready for one, you're probably ready for one. Uh, Lynn, do you have anything to add to that? Is, has that well, been your I, I would say 
that um, Olivia's experience was unusual. Uh, most people seek agents and agents don't come to them. And agents are extraordinarily busy these days and um, they often don't respond to queries, even with a form letter saying, no, thank you. So it's very frustrating. That's one of the biggest problems that I hear from writers that they send queries to agent after agent and get zero response. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's despite there being professional writers and experienced journalists. Um, so I think uh, it's probably a function of the times. And um, I certainly agree with Olivia that uh, an agent's necessary to sell a book and, and to represent you in terms of rights and uh, all other matters that would be involved in uh, perhaps a writer editor interactions. An agent will, will be there to be helpful, plus all the great advice that an agent can give in, in shaping up the proposal and in commenting on the book if she or he is willing to do so as it progresses. But um, getting an agent is tough. So um, I, I wouldn't uh, tell anybody to bat their head against the wall trying to do that. I tell them to, to write the best they can write. And if they're fortunate to connect with the, the right agent, then they'll be able to move forward. And if not, there are still uh, a lot of avenues for publishing today that never existed previously. And uh, they might choose to go that route. Yeah, I think anytime you can uh, be at a function, not not maybe not right now, but anytime there's like a meet and greet with agents kind of thing, or if you know, you know, you have peers, science writer friends that have an agent, you know, like, hey, can you introduce me? Hey, do you have recommendations? Those kind of connections can also be a great inroad. I've definitely um, sent my friends to my agent before, you know what I mean? I, if I know your work and I, I feel like you're going to be a good match, I have, will not hesitate to say, oh, hey. Let me let me help you out. Let me introduce you to my agency. See if there's someone there that that would be interested in representing you. That kind of thing. Very good. Well, we will leave it at that. Lynn and Olivia, thank you so much for taking time to illuminate us on your uh, book, Olivia. Congratulations on your book and on the book writing business. The book again is Women in White Coats and. Um, see uh, quickly see the chat link for some information about the book and about NASW. Um, this has been an extremely informative hour uh, and enjoyable and um, thank you both for joining us and thank you all in the audience for, for tuning in. Have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you for having us.